So today I wanted to talk about this process of reverse engineering an off-the-shelf quadcopter gimbal to use for my robot, Tuco Flyer. Previously on episode 21, and in countless live streams now, there have been some really detailed uh, explanations of individual parts of the reverse engineering process. But here I wanted to try to keep it really kind of high level and talk about, you know, why we're doing this, what we've actually learned, and, you know, try not to bore everyone too badly. So I'm, I've already been pretty effectively projecting the image that this reverse engineering takes a lot of time and effort to complete, which is true. But then I get the question a lot, well, why are you spending all this time reverse engineering a gimbal when you could be building one from scratch? And well, I mean, one answer is that that's just like a very different thing to do, um, you know, building something versus reversing it. Um, but and I think another answer is that I think it's still a lot less work at this point to find an off-the-shelf product that does most of what I want and customize it for that last little bit of functionality. And especially from my point of view, reverse engineering this thing, while I certainly have to understand uh, some key components of the system, like how it stores configuration values and how the communications work between microcontrollers to some extent, there's so much of the system that I can choose not to understand because it already exists. So I think from my point of view, having seen these uh, components at both kind of a high level of abstraction and really close up, um, you know, I think there's a lot of complexity that you, you, know, you don't expect um, that is actually there that you're getting for free when you um, use something that already exists versus having to make it from scratch. So in this case, the gimbal that I bought, which is um, from Feiyu Tech, uh, it's their mini 3D gimbal. Uh, they make various gimbals, but this is a pretty basic one that's designed for quadcopters. And it's actually a pretty nice design with one microcontroller in each of the three joints, really nice machined aluminum components and a magnetic encoder backing each of the brushless motors. The initial way in that we found was via a sort of configuration serial port mode that was used for just a few basic things like um, calibrating the roll offset on the accelerometer uh, by some Windows software that comes with the gimbal. But via that serial port, you can extrapolate the presence of a lot of other functionality and browse through this what turns out to be a space of 128 separate 16-bit signed numbers for each axis that correspond to both the internal state and the configuration of all the various control loops and motor controller parts. But as we explained in much more detail in episode 21, the real break in this came from uh, actually getting an unencrypted copy of the firmware image by figuring out the firmware update process and finding the firmware update keys still left over in RAM after the system boots. By analyzing the firmware image, we can get an exhaustive list of all the serial commands that are available, and we can start to piece together how the control loop works, as well as how those control loop values might be accessible via the serial interface. Originally, I wasn't planning on doing such intense modifications to the gimbal. I was planning on just using it pretty much as designed, sending it the equivalent of uh, RC servo receiver pulses. But it was really tempting to read out the existing sensors to figure out where the gimbal was pointed. And uh, I was sort of baited into doing this by uh, some of my viewers. And so we took a closer look at the firmware and then got sucked into this process much more deeply when um, I accidentally modified the configuration in such a way that caused the gimbal to sort of try to break itself every time it powered on. So then the process switched from being a uh, investigation into more of a repair. So as a side effect of having inadvertently damaged this gimbal's factory configuration, I had to go pretty deep in understanding the calibration mechanism. And so one of, the, one of my viewers, Mark, uh, kindly donated a backup gimbal of the same model, which we used as a reference for extracting sort of known good configurations. But we still had to understand the configuration mechanism well enough to kind of do a transformation to account for the individual manufacturing differences between these two gimbals. So there are actually, knowing what I know now, uh, four different calibration values stored by the gimbal that depend on kind of the individual unit to unit variations in these devices. The only one of these exposed to the end user is actually what turns out to be an accelerometer offset for calibrating kind of the horizon level for the camera, um, trimming out any roll that you might have. There's also a gyroscope trimming adjustment, but this seems to be made automatically every time the gimbal powers on. And then there are two calibration parameters which depend on the orientation of some magnets which were glued to the motors during assembly on each axis. 
One of these calibration points was pretty obvious. It's just the center pose, so the camera pointing straight forward. And the other one baffled me for quite a while. This point definitely seemed to be related to something about the motor alignment, but it was hard to tell really exactly what was going on. I tried my best to copy this calibration point from that known good reference gimbal by just manually transcribing the angles, you know, setting the motors to the same angles. So that got me close enough to use this gimbal for quite a while, but the gimbal wasn't quite calibrated right, and in certain poses it would start to um, kind of wobble or it would, uh, it would buzz audibly. And some of this, I would later find out, was actually just due to the weight distribution changing when I mounted the camera differently, um, which is, you know, to be expected. But um, some of it was also due to this um, bad motor calibration. It would later turn out that I needed to kind of go back in and understand the motor um, control loops a little bit better so that I could actually adjust the gain. In this most recent uh, dive into the motor controller code in the disassembler, I found some really useful tidbits. I managed to trace through the, um, the A to D controller related code enough to figure out where I could find both um, unfiltered and filtered representations of the motor current. There seems to be an IIR filter, an FIR filter, and some kind of peak detector in the firmware. And so I can use that to get a slightly cleaned up version of the motor current, which has also been transformed to account for the angle of the current in the different windings of the motor. So that's really useful, and I can look for oscillation in those values in order to detect um, this vibration that I've been having trouble with occasionally. I can also look for this value just being over a threshold for some particular amount of time just to detect when the motor is working too hard because it's up against some kind of mechanical obstruction. So I've been able to use that to pull the motor current and detect problems and shut down the gimbal if any problems are detected, which is pretty nice. One of the more interesting finds was actually this motor mode variable um, at param 18, uh, which seems to have values between 0 and 6. So 0 is motor off, 1 is normal operation, but all of the other modes seem to be designed for either um, sort of development purposes or factory calibration. And in particular, there's one mode that makes it very easy to get the motor to cog into these locations that uh, seem to be really the, um, the kind of maximum flux uh, when the first motor winding is powered. And so this, it turns out, is the reference location that we're looking for for calibration point one. And I verified that due to symmetry, there are six different angles that all work equally well for calibration point one. So if you put the motor into this mode where it's cogging, the algorithm actually assumes that it's at the reference angle, so angle zero relative to calibration point one, and then the magnetic field will actually pull it toward that location. So it acts like a simple closed loop system to calibrate the motor, which seems nice. Some of the other motor modes were also interesting for understanding the system. So you can bypass the stabilization system entirely and just give the low level motor controller values that seem to either be a velocity or a torque, depending on the mode. Um, there are also some modes where instead of using the real magnetic encoders, it either assumes that we're always at angle zero, which is the one you use for calibration. There's also one that will uh, rotate the reference angle at a fixed rate, which is really useful for just kind of testing the motor, since um, under no load that will actually cause the motor to rotate at the same rate. These different modes were especially useful for reverse engineering because they allow kind of turning entire subsystems within the gimbal on and off effectively, um, looking at just how the low-level motor controller works, um, which seems to be kind of a current feedback loop. It's trying to achieve a particular current in the windings, um, rotate that to a particular position. Um, and then at a higher level, there's a velocity controller where you can give the motor um, what seems to be an angular velocity, and it tries to match that. And then higher still, there are the control loops that try to track position and then stabilize uh, using the feedback from the IMU. So I think this is already getting a little bit long, but I hope that was an interesting taste of what I've learned from going into the gimbal firmware and how it's helped. Um, we really have a lot more control over this gimbal now and the sensors, and this is really uh, enabled me to tune the gimbal more for this particular um, sort of strange project. And I, I certainly enjoy this much more than um, having to design something completely from scratch every time. Um, you know, there, there's been plenty of opportunity to design components for this robot from scratch, but it's 
really nice. Um, I really enjoy being able to take something off the shelf and be able to understand it well enough that I can modify it for my particular use. So hope that was interesting. I hope um, if you want some more detail, there's an entire GitHub repo um, full of tools related to this project at scanlime slash fygimbal. Um, and some of the more recent um, notes and code related to this live inside the Tuco Flyer repository. And yeah, I hope that was interesting. And I hope maybe um, if you have a device out there that almost but doesn't quite do what you want, then uh, maybe this will inspire you to take an attempt at reverse engineering it so that you can figure out how to make it uh, work a little bit better for you. Happy hacking, folks. I'll see you next time. And a uh, special thanks to everyone who supports the channel with uh, things to take apart, with uh, Patreon donations that keep the lights on in the shop, or just uh, sharing content with your friends when you think they might like it. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll see you next time.